Love without betrayal. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is in our stars, not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Tonight I went out to walk my dogs, and there were about 50 white circles lit up in the grass, as if someone had somehow made an earth mirror of stars in the sky. It was twilight, and it took my breath away. I looked up to see where the source of light was, and when I looked back, I saw that the little lights were actually those weird fluffy things, you know, dandelion seeds, the things that when you blow on them, they disperse, and I laughed. I had seen something that was there for a second and then gone. The night I met the father of my child, I wore a rayon vintage dress and a fedora hat and many silver bracelets on my left wrist. I judged men solely on the basis of their numerology. <laughs> I could love them if our numbers were compatible. My boyfriend at the time said, that guy looks just like my biological father and you are going to leave me for him. The next night I went to see the guy's paintings in the studio where he also lived and nine months later moved in as his wife. When I did his numerology, I kne kneeled on the floor next to his couch and said, don't you know why I'm here? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> and I thought he was lying because I knew we were getting married. The truth was, I hadn't liked his numerology. His destiny path was a two, but <laughs> something other than me knew something I didn't know. From the beginning, I did everything I, I did everything to make it work. The fault was in myself for sure. So I set about to make this union the best I could. He promised he would fill up the holes in my pockets. Up to that point in my life, everything had been a struggle. I was raised to be an artist. My mother denies this and says with conviction that she raised me to be a human being, no matter what. I was the kind of person who looked at events and people and surrounded everything with an infinity and let reality fall wherever it may. <coughs> this philosophy worked incredibly well in my career, but did not serve me in relationships. A month after we were married, I went to Chicago to do a play for nine months, and though leaving him was hard, I was grateful to get away because frankly, I was nervous about the commitment thing. When I returned, we began our real marriage and it was a struggle. Something inside me had begun to awaken in Chicago. It dawned on me that I had a lot of knowledge in my field and I felt a desire to give back. Then, my aunt died and it had a profound effect on me. I decided I needed to have a baby. Something bigger than me crept into my consciousness. I felt the finite nature of all living things and I wished for all the experiences life had to offer. After all, how could I ever play Lady Macbeth if I hadn't been a mother? <laughs> when, I was, <laughs> when I was 17, my boyfriend was killed in a car accident. That summer, I took a walk on the road in New Hampshire where our vacation home was. I looked up at the stars, and I knew that there was something more than just us here. In the black starry night, I had a feeling of spiritual connection. I knew I was changed forever. From then on, I looked for people who understood my sadness. Sometimes, my thoughts go below the surface of where I think they belong. And looking into that abyss has given me a vantage point. I have learned to live with that struggle. My aunt died, and it was my turn to live. I got pregnant, but had a miscarriage. During the next round of trying, my best friend became ill. 
Because I visited her every day, I could see that I had to give up my quest for a baby. Two years later, she died, and I got pregnant. It was a miracle. I was 44, which was the numeric vibration of the eight. <laughs> Meaning, money, fame, wealth, and power. But the most important vibration of the eight was responsibility, for which I had no frame of reference. When I was six, I decided my father was never coming back. My mental proclamation went like this, Papa owes me for a second, third, fourth, fifth, and now sixth birthday present. So from now on, whenever anyone asks me about my father, I'm going to say I don't have one. He was a man who had five wives, nine children, and let's face it, betrayed everyone he tried to be close to. The culmination was drinking himself to death at 50, the ultimate betrayal. He left my mother when I was two, and eventually I understood how lucky it was that I didn't get to know him. On my 16th birthday, we read in the Sunday New York Times that he had died. So when I had my son, Right away, I felt as if I had been given a gift, a gift that was entirely separate from me, but in my care. I couldn't believe my good fortune. I thought my job was to not get in the way of who and what he wanted to be. I was surprised when I didn't feel the way other people said they felt. I never wanted to get away from him or have a vacation. I never wanted him to stay in any, in any stage and not grow up. My love for him felt like my insides had moved around like a continental shift, like a magnet from the center of the earth. As he grew, I found that many of the things I was inept at as a grown-up person turned into assets as a mother. The ability to do only one thing at a time <laughs> became a kind of infinite patience. The need to put other people first became a gift for paying attention to my child. The capacity to love without getting it back became a sturdy, <laughs> unselfish ladder for helping him grow into who he, needed in, who he needed to be. Thinking that artistic freedom mattered more than anything else helped me welcome and love all of his creative interests. He gave me an understanding of love and a connection to myself. I began to realize that maybe my whole life I had been searching for this feeling of purpose. As soon as I had him, I felt for the first time, I know how to do this. Raising him was so much fun. He wrapped the entire loft we lived in in dental floss. <laughs> he hung all kinds of objects in it, a whisk, Legos, transformers, and other things. We left it up for two days. An incredible art piece. I wrote down everything he did and said so later on he could have a record of himself as a baby and toddler and kid. He said things to me like, Mom, the wind is a magnet and pulls everything to it. Mom, what would a man be without his behavior? Mom, how can your whole body breathe? You can't even hear it breathe, so how can it breathe? Mom, if tonight is tonight, then the morning is to morning. Tomorrow is right now, and today was tomorrow yesterday. <laughs> so now this thing has happened. He's 18, and he just got into college. Why didn't anyone at any time tell me one day he would leave? And that is a fact. Why wasn't it said, well, you know you want to do this thing, but really it will be a kind of agony when he grows up, so just know that. They do say things like, it goes by so fast, and enjoy him now. But they never say, he may want to get an actual tattoo on his face. <laughs> you know, he'll probably want to dye his hair blue. But really, he's going to grow up and be whoever he wants to be as a person, and then you'll have to live with that forever. Uh -huh. If we are all underlings, 
and nature runs its course and kids leave. Intimacy equals a kind of death and love has a built-in kind of betrayal. A child must be a gift truly from God. And when he says, you know, Mom, I think without tenderness, it takes you longer to get where you need to go. You wait for all these things and hope for them, and then they come as white circles for flowers in the grass, and you let it all be there and then gone. Mm -hmm. wow.